Hello and welcome to the Fossil Huntress podcast. I hope you guys are all doing very well. Today on the show, I thought we would go and explore the story of an evolutionary aha moment that came from a single partial fossil skull found on the shores of a riverbank in eastern Canada. And this wee skull, combined with a number of other fossils, helped us gain an understanding of the transition of fish to tetrapods and the eventual jump to modern vertebrates. So embedded in the tale is some history and the origin of the human and vertebrate hands, a little bit about our early geology and about our our young Canada when we were a young country and some of our proud and less proud history. So wherever you are in the world, fly with me over to North America, to Turtle Island, over to Canada's far eastern coast. So if you're looking on a map, look for the big blue area of Hudson's Bay and then head south of there to Quebec. And between Quebec and New Brunswick is a little slip of land. It looks like a tongue sticking out and it's the Gaspé Peninsula. And so we're going to be heading there today and I'll tell you the tale of finding some wonderful transitional uh, specimens that help us understand our evolutionary leap from fish to tetrapods and it'll take us back in time to the late Devonian. That small bit of skull, that wee fossil from the late Devonian, was the Stegocephalian Elpistostege watsoni. So this is an extinct genus of finned tetrapodomorphs, and they lived and he lived during the late Devonian. So this is around 382 million years ago, so a long time ago. And Elpistostege watsoni is perhaps the sister taxon to all the other tetrapods. And the fossil was described in 1938, so many moons ago, by British paleontologist and elected fellow of the Royal Society of London, Thomas Stanley Westall. So Westall had done a lot of research in various areas, so his interests were wide-ranging. He was a vertebrate paleontologist and geologist, and he's perhaps best known for his innovative work. He was an opinionated little fellow. Um, His opinionated work and his innovative work on the Paleozoic fishes and their various relationships to tetrapods. So as a specialist in early fish, Westall was asked to interpret this single partial skull roof that was discovered in Quebec in eastern Canada. And his findings gave us the publication that would name Elpistostege Watsone and also help us to understand the evolution of fish to tetrapods, so four-limbed vertebrates, and one of the most important transformations in vertebrate evolution. One of the challenges in piecing together an evolutionary story is seeing all the pieces for what they are. And when you find specimens and you only find bits and pieces, sometimes the critical piece is not the one you find. So in this case, a pectoral fin. So hypothesis of tetrapod origin relied heavily on the anatomy of but a few tetrapod-like fossil fish from the middle and late Devonian, so 393 to 359 million years ago. So these taxa, and they're known as the Elpistostaglians, include Pandorichthys, Elpistostege, and Tictaclic, and none of which had revealed the complete skeletal anatomy of the pectoral fin. That was until 2010, when a complete 1.57 1.57 meters, so a big boy, articulated specimen was um, found and described by Richard Cloutier and friends. So it took them about a decade to finally put that paper together, and it's probably because there was so much prep and um, analysis that needed to go into it. But the specimen helped us to understand the origin 
of the vertebrate hand. So taking a look at fish into tetrapods and the homologous, so the, the similar bone arrangement or the phalanges, the finger bones of modern tetrapods to the basal tetramorphs. So we were able to look at a fully complete specimen and make some um, wow moment comparisons. So once all that painstaking preparation had been done on the 2010 specimen, and with the help of some CT scanners, we could now clearly see that the skeleton of the pectoral fin, that piece of the fossil that was sort of the linchpin missing from other specimens, had four rows of radials, so two of which included branched carpals, as well as two distal rows organized as digits and punitive digits. And so what does that mean and why is that exciting? It tells us and shows us that in this in-between species, between fish and land vertebrates, that the fin retains those wee fin rays distal to the radials, and this arrangement confirmed an age-old question, showing us for the first time that the origin of phalanges, those little finger bones, preceded the loss of fin rays and not the other way around. E. Watsoni is also very closely related to Tiktaklik. So this is a um, specimen that was found in 2004 in the Canadian Arctic. It's a tetrapodomorpha species and these are advanced forms of transitional um, uh, species between fish and the early labyrinthodonts. So we playfully refer to these as fishopods, half fish, half tetrapod, both in appearance and in limb morphology. Up to that point, the relationship of limbed vertebrates, the tetrapods, to lobed fin fish was well known but the origin of the major tetrapod features remained relatively obscure, and that's for lack of fossils that documented that particular sequence of evolutionary change. That was until Tiktaklik. So while Tiktaklik is technically a fish, this fellow is as far from fish-like as you can be and still be a card-carrying member of the group. So complete with scales and gills, this protofish lacks the conical head we see in modern fish and rather has a flattened triangular head, more like that of a crocodile. So he has fins with thin ray bones for paddling like most fish, but inside those fins are these brawny interior bones that gave Tiktaklik the ability to prop himself up using his limbs for support. So I kind of picture him propping up on one paddle saying, how you doing? So six years after Tiktaklik was discovered, and that was by Neil Shubin and Steve Gateway and um, team. And if you haven't had a chance to read the book, uh, Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin, it's a wonderful read about his career in that find and highly, highly recommend. So six years after they found that specimen, in the ice-covered tundra of the Canadian Arctic on southern Ellesmere Island, a team working the outcrops at McGuasha on the Gaspé Peninsula discovered the only full specimen, so the only complete specimen of E. Watsoni ever found to date. And um, it was a tantalizing find to have that, again, another transitional species, another tetrapodomorph found. And these are, so Tiktaklik, very rare. Iwatsone, still pretty rare. We've only found four specimens in, of Iwatsone over 130 years of collecting. So, um, and charmingly, that particular specimen was found right on our doorstep, so it was extracted but a few feet away from the main stairs that descend onto the beach of Maguasha National Park. So Maguasha is nestled in the Gaspésie or Gaspé Peninsula or Gaspé-Gouagi region of Canada and it's home of the Mi'kmaq First Nations 
who self-refer as the new. So the word Micmac actually means the family or my allies and friends. And they are the people of the sea and the original inhabitants of Atlantic Canada, having lived there for more than 10,000 years. The Lanu were the first First Nations people to establish contact and trade with European explorers in the 16th and 17th centuries. So sailing vessels filled with French and British and Scottish and Irish and others arrived one by one to lay claim to the area. There were some Vikings who arrived a bit earlier, but uh, much, much earlier, settling and fighting over the land. Around 1760, the British won the Battle of the Restigouche, so the last naval battle between France and England for possession of the North American continent, Turtle Island. And this bittersweet British victory sparked the American War of Independence. And for the next 20 years, the Lanu, or Micmac, would witness and become embroiled in another war for these lands, first as bystanders, Then briefly with some of the younger uh, members of the group becoming American allies and then being intimidated into submission by the British Royal Navy. So they came by with a show of force by way of a 34-gun man of war, encouraging, she said politely, the Lanu into compliance. So in it finally culminating um, an end to those hostilities between the Americans, who sometimes are referred to as rebels, so in that war of independence, um, from the British in the Treaty of Paris, which was signed around 1783. So the peace accord sadly held no provisions for the Lanou or Métis or First Nations impacted So none of these newcomers were in fact Micmac. They were neither friends nor allies. And so it was to this area, 60 years later, that the newly formed Geologic Survey of Canada, or GSC, began exploring and mapping the newly formed United Province of Canada. So geologists in New Brunswick um, traipsed through the rugged countryside that would become a Canadian province in 1867. And it was on one of these expeditions that the Maguasha fossil outcrops were first discovered. And they too would transform in time to become Maguasha National Park or Parc de Maguasha. But at first, They were simply a hillside across the water and a treasure trove of newly discovered late Devonian fauna. In the summer of 1842, Abraham Gesner, who was New Brunswick's first provincial geologist, crossed the northern part of the region exploring for coal. So he's walking in the footsteps of where those uh, amazing battles happened for um, first the British and the French, French, and then the British and the Americans, and at all times um, the home of the Micmac or the Lanou. So he's walking and exploring in the northern part of New Brunswick, where it abuts uh, Quebec, and he's meant to be exploring for coal. So he was mostly looking for coal, but Gesner also had a keen eye for fossils in this trip that he was doing along the northern border, followed fast on the heels of his explorations um, around the Bay of Fundy, where we find the beautiful Joggins Cliffs with standing trees. So he had a strong interest in geology and paleontology and a keen eye for both. And he was also a bit of an inventor. So he was a good chemist, And he is perhaps most famous for his invention of the process to distill the combustible hydrocarbon kerosene from coal oil. So a subject that he would have had lots of time to ponder on his long walks exploring a budding Canada. And we have him to thank for the modern petrology industry. So he filed many patents for clever ways to distill the soft tar-like coal or bitumen still in use today. Following the Restigouche River in New Brunswick through the Dalhousie region, 
Gesner crossed through the estuary to reach the southern coast of the Gaspé Peninsula. So he had a keen eye and was able to see that this was lovely sedimentary um, outcrops and they might contain fossils and he was quite right. In his 1843 report to the Geologic Survey, he wrote, I found the shore lined with coarse conglomerate. Farther eastward, the rocks are light blue sandstones and shales containing the remains of vegetables, so not his best work in terms of ID. In these sandstones and shales, I found the remains of fish and small species of tortoise with, foot, with fossil footmarks. So we know now that that little tortoise he reported was the famous Bothriolepis, a type of placoderm fish. And it was also the first formal mention of the Maguasha fauna in scientific literature. So despite the circulation of his report, um, his discovery was all but ignored for a time and the cliffs and their fossil bounty were abandoned for decades to come. So geologists like Ells and Ford and Weston and researchers uh, White Eaves and Dawson would eventually follow in Gesner's footsteps. But at the time, the focus was really on the exploration for coal. Over the past 180 years, the Devonian outcrops at Maguasha have yielded a wonderfully diverse aquatic assemblage from the age of fishes. So five of the six fossil fish groups associated with the Devonian are found here, including exceptionally well-preserved fossil specimens of our lobed finned fishes, which of course is exciting because they gave rise to the first four-legged air-breathing terrestrial vertebrates, the tetrapods. And we find um, some of the lower vertebrates, a limited invertebrate assemblage, along with some terrestrial material as well. So plants and scorpions and millipedes. And in looking at it, we can see that it is a, an estuary that was a, um, a place where a river meets the sea. So briny, a little bit salty. And so we know our E. Watsoni like to live in the cool river waters that were mixed with just a bit of fresh and a bit of salt, so not fully fresh water, but a wee bit of salinity to add flavor. So I think I'll leave it there and thank you guys for listening. Take care. Bye-bye now.